We start with a single cell, a stem cell. And when that cell enters our research network all over the world, it becomes the most powerful tool we have in medical research today. Good evening, and welcome to the 2020 Gala in Science Fair of the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. I'm Dr. Sanjay Gupta, and it is my great pleasure to be your host for this evening's program. Over the next hour, we're going to hear from NICEF scientists, an impressive array of special guests, and the three 2020 NICEF stem cell heroes, David Rockwell, Dr. Brooke Ellison, and Frank Geary. Our theme tonight is show up for science. And what a critical time this is to put science and NICEF research center stage. Seems every day now we're reminded of how urgently we need NICEF and science to lead the way in defeating COVID-19. So tonight we're gonna show up and we're gonna learn about exciting advances in stem cell research and we're gonna show up and we're gonna support the vital role NICEF plays in advancing the most promising scientific breakthroughs. Now last year when I visited the NICEF Research Institute in Manhattan, I was pretty blown away by the exceptionally innovative work they're doing in these state-of-the-art laboratories. I saw it myself. And I am honored now to help bring some of that science into your homes. It's really amazing stuff. Throughout the program tonight, you're gonna to see instructions on your screens for ways to help accelerate these cures. You can support NICEF by texting, by calling, by making a gift, and you can join the list of names that's gonna be strolling across your screen over the next hour. And to that end, I'd like to just take a moment now to recognize this evening's sponsors for championing NICEF. I am told and fully believe that this virtual celebration and NICEF's work would not be possible without them. So thank you. And now to get us started, I'd like to welcome the CEO and the founder of the NICEF Institute, an extraordinary and tireless woman. She's built this organization over the past 15 years. You all know her, Susan. Let me just ask first, how are you? How are you doing with, uh, with COVID life? Sanjay, it's great to see you. Um, and I'm okay. Uh, you know, it's, it's certainly really challenging times. Um, but we're staying focused on the work. Uh, we're staying positive and optimistic. I, I you know, as you know, I, I had a chance to visit with you, spend some time in the labs, and you know, you, your your head just gets spinning when you when you have an experience like that, at all that is possible. And I want to ask you about some of what's been most recently happening during COVID at the labs. But c can you just give us an idea of of some of the some of the science that you're working on. I mean, some of that seemed like it was pretty much on the cusp of possibly becoming clinical medicine. Uh, yeah, I remember that actually you were visiting the lab the day that we had the big breakthrough in diabetes uh, and we're making terrific progress uh, in MS and Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, and then of course our clinical trial where we're replacing the cells uh, and with you know working cells for people who have gone blind from macular degeneration, it's really exciting. Um, and then, you know, with COVID, uh, we were able, because of um, how we're structured, we were able to immediately uh, pivot and, um, and make the, uh, the cells of the lung that are affected by the disease and distribute them to researchers around the world uh, who are working to develop treatments for, for the virus. So it's pretty incredible. I mean, I know that, that that can take a period of time, but to be able to, you know, be that nimble, to say that this is a disease we didn't even know of a year ago and to start thinking about cell-based therapies, you know, I think is, is really fascinating. One thing I remember talking to you about, Susan, when we were there, this is neither an academic organization uh, nor a purely private organization. Is that right? How, how do you, what is the structure of NICEF? Uh, we're, we're a nonprofit, um, but we actually are unusual uh, because um, we've got the best of, of all worlds. We're supported by philanthropy, and so that means that we can do the really high-risk, high-return work. And uh, we are able to uh, bring together, you know, the, the best minds, the most brilliant people. Um, and then we can also do the, uh, uh, the technical work um, with our robotics and machine learning um, that you need to do to actually get from that aha idea in an academic institution um, and bring it to the patients. And that's what we're doing. Um, we are really actively moving now from uh, uh, the bench, the academic bench, um, to the patient bedside. It's very exciting. And throughout tonight's program, we're going to hear about this through conversations, videos, and more while we celebrate our extraordinary stem cell heroes, David Rockwell, Dr. Brooke Ellison, and Frank Geary. 
I'm so excited for everyone to learn more, so let's get started. In 2005, the stem cell field was in its infancy and lacked the talent and funding needed to capitalize on its potential. Inspired by the enormous opportunities human cells offered to better understand why we were getting sick and to develop cures for our loved ones, Susan Solomon founded the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute with the support of many of the leading researchers in the field. Now, NICIF is delivering on this promise and positioning patients everywhere for a brighter future. We began by building a pipeline, supporting the most talented young scientists, the next generation of brilliant researchers doing the finest stem cell work around the world. Today, a community of over 200 scientists. Very quickly, we expanded to open our own laboratory which is now the leading independent nonprofit stem cell research institute in the world. Employing over 100 people, including 75 full-time researchers, computer scientists, and engineers who are developing technologies to enable personalized medicine and to ensure that we have the right treatments for the right patients. NICIF Discoveries have twice been named Time Magazine's number one medical breakthrough of the year, and our research and support has resulted in 18 programs that are now in or approaching clinical trials. We make sure to convene the top minds globally, building support for science, educating the public, the scientific community, and our children, assuring that all of them, like all of you, will show up for science for personal medicine, community, for my type 1 diabetic son, advancing science, the future, so we can have science for the benefit of us all. Good evening. I'm Jane Krakowski, and you may know me as an award-winning actress, but what you may not know is that I am a newly noted stem cell expert. I am thrilled to be joining the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute on this very, very special night. And it is my honor to introduce you all to NICIF's Dr. Daniel Paul. Hi. Um, I understand that you're a pretty big deal around here. So would you prefer that I call you Master Scientist or Dr. Genius? Dan is fine. OK, Dr. Genius. <laughs> For the purposes of this conversation, I thought it'd be fun to mix it up a little bit and like we're doing an acting exercise. So for the purposes of, of this evening, you will perform the part of the expert and I will be performing the part of the simple layperson who has never heard this information, possibly like the people who are at home listening. So please start from the beginning and imagine that I know nothing. <laughs> well, I'll, I'll do my best. Let's start with stem cells. I'm sure this is something that many of you have heard about. Um, and one of the things that often is discussed is treating blood cancer. And so there, when people get a bone marrow transplant, that's one type of, of stem cell being used. But actually, in our body right now, there's all sorts of stem cells. And they're constantly repopulating those tissues. <laughs> Jeez. Damn, that was like stem cell 101. Do you think I'm an idiot or something? I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Please continue for everyone at home, obviously. Tell me, how would you use these different types of stem cells in your research? Actually, we use a slightly different kind of stem cell here. Uh, we're interested in something that we call an induced pluripotent stem cell. And for that, we take a very small piece of skin, about the size of an apple seed, and from that, we can make stem cells. OK, so you've taken my skin or my blood, and now you've grown a stem cell. What can you do with it? And when should I start expecting my residuals, Dan? Sure. Well, we can use these stem cells to turn them into any kind of cell um, in, that you would find in the body. And one of the amazing things about these cells is that they can grow to unlimited supply. And so we're using them right now to be able to screen for drugs and importantly as well, growing new cells that could one day go back into the body. Wait, so you're telling me that you can replace damaged cells with perfectly new ones? Ugh, why did I give up smoking and drinking? Well. As a scientist, I must say, smoking kills. And if we can give it up, you should be giving up smoking. We are making tremendous strides in, in developing these new tissues and, and hope one day that we could treat lung cancer in this way. But at the moment, we're still very early in the development of this work. OK, so 
please, for the people at home, could we hear an example of how you're putting this into your practice? Yeah, absolutely. So there are absolutely some diseases that we are treating already with stem cells. And so some of those are things like macular degener degeneration, where we're putting the cells right back into the, the people to either prevent them going blind or help restore some vision. As likewise, we're putting brain cells back into the brains of patients suffering from diseases like Parkinson's disease. I, I, that is just so remarkable. When I hear you talk about stuff like that, it just, it just reminds me why I went into this business in the first place, truly. So tell me, what are all the big science machines that I've been hearing so much about there? So creating these stem cells is an enormously labor-intensive process. And one of the things we really want to understand is how populations and different people are affected by these diseases. And so we've built out a fully automated system to help us do this work using robots. This is really unique to NICEF. No one else in the world has anything like this. We've brought together an incredible team of what are traditionally discrete disciplines, things like computer science, engineering, and biology, to build the system for studying complex biological challenges and large populations of people. Oh, I have to bring my son there when things settle down a little bit, because he loves pressing buttons over and over again until they actually stop functioning. That's OK, right? No, it's not. OK, I'll have my people set it up. So once you've created the cells, how do you actually use them? Yeah, so we can basically recapitulate a disease within the dish. Don't forget, these cells have come from someone, and that person might have a disease. So let's say Parkinson's as an example. Instead of having to open their brain and look inside, we can grow their brain cells within the dish, and it gives us a window into understanding how this disease is progressing and ultimately use it to screen for drugs. One example of how we're doing this right now is in COVID. We're able to grow very small lung organoids or bits of lung tissue to understand how both the virus is getting into the cells and maybe how we could either kill it or stop it from getting in in the first place. That would be amazing. Have they found anything yet? Yeah, so with collaborators that we've been working with, uh, we actually have found some drugs and they're in clinical trials at the moment. That is so fantastic, and I know we're all waiting for that, and it's very comforting to hear that you're working so hard on it. Thank you. Doctor, master, genius, scientist, I want to thank you so much for doing this with me. Um, when I was asked to do this, they told me that you were a real nicest kind of guy, and they weren't kidding. I actually think you're the nicest est. Well, thank you very much. This has been a whole lot of fun. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, wait. What's this? Oh, no! I won another award? I won a STEMI for this, this appearance tonight? Oh, thank you so much. I am, I'm, just, I'm just in shock. Um, thank you. Thank you so much to the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Thank you to Paul Goldberger and Susan Solomon. Thank you to Scott Ellis for making me do this video. Thank you for my son for actually making this award. Oh, look, it turns just like a Tony. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> And now, as a longtime New Yorker, it is my very distinct privilege to introduce a man that is as rich in spirit and generosity as anyone I know. He is someone who has always helped the city in times of crisis. I am a big fan. It is my great honor to introduce Mayor Michael Bloomberg. Hello, everyone. I'm Mike Bloomberg. You can always count on me to show up for science. From the beginning, I've been glad to support the Foundation's pioneering, life-saving work. Susan and Paul have really built it into a force over the years, and innovation in biomedical research has never been more important than it is right now amid the pandemic. We're all grateful to the stem cell heroes we honor tonight, Dr. Brooke Ellison, Frank Gehry, and an artist we've gotten to know well at Bloomberg Philanthropies, David Rockwell. Name a brilliant New York design project and David likely helped to bring it to life. From Broadway shows, to children's playgrounds, to cutting edge art venues such as the Shed at Hudson Yards and the Pearlman that's rising now at the World Trade Center. David even designed the foundation's science fair. He's not just uniquely creative, he's civic minded and incredibly generous with his time and talent. So thank you, David, and congratulations. On my earliest interest was in theater. My mom was a dancer and started a community theater. And that became a lifelong love affair with the way physical space becomes 
the cues to allow people to collect and create big communities, small communities. It's evolved into hospitals and airports and restaurants and theaters and parks. I think the key to successful design is telling a very specific story. And I think uh, without a narrative design, it's just a series of colors or choices. I think a little over 10 years ago, Paul and Susan invited me to learn more about NYSEF. I felt like it was something I wanted to be involved with. We came up with the idea of formatting the pre-event as a kind of science fair, so that people there could have a direct connection between someone they knew, someone they cared about, and research that was being done right there in the present. Everyone has had a loved one affected by Alzheimer's or HIV AIDS or cancer. And my brother died of AIDS long before there was any real research about what could be done about it. And now with COVID, you know, it seems even more relevant that we have to be on the front foot on research, taking things that were previously thought of as incurable and making those curable, finding ways that the real data and the real science help us find ways forward. One of the things that I find so extraordinary about NYSEF is their engagement in research and new information. What has been so life-giving about Rockwell Group for me is that we're always learning. In the last four years, I've gone back to something I loved as a kid, which was playing piano. And I'm understanding more and more the, uh, the connection between detailed study, breaking something down into its smallest components, and then based on those components, building up a language musically. And uh, I now realize that's, of course, what I do architecturally, but sometimes pulling back the camera and applying it to something else gives you a new way into it. I think there is a newfound drive and appreciation for science. It's important to celebrate what NYSEF does and understand that our way forward on this planet is by figuring out how to deal proactively with disease. And that has never been more relevant. Thank you so much, Mike Bloomberg, uh, for that uh, generous and beautiful introduction. I so appreciate it. And thank you to Susan Solomon. You were one of my major heroes. And thank you to the New York Stem Cell Foundation for this incredible honor. Let me start by saying that amidst all the noise right now, it is such a relief to be a part of an event in which everyone believes in science. As a citizen of New York and a citizen of the world, I've never been more appreciative of the heroes of medical science as I am right now. I can't think of another time when the issue of public health felt so vital to our way of life and even our very existence. So I've designed their galas ever since then, and as a layperson, I'll never have more than an outline understanding of everything that goes on behind the scenes at NYSEF. But what I can understand is that the meaningful end results of their work speak for themselves. I can't tell you how much this means to me and how humbled I am to be honored by the New York Stem Cell Foundation. I want to thank everyone who had a hand in making this possible. I want to congratulate Frank Geary and Dr. Brooke Ellison. And of course, thank you to all of my friends and colleagues who came out and are supporting this great, great institution, this great, great mission. Science does matter, science is real, and science will save us. Thank you so much for this honor. Good evening, I'm Kelly O'Hara, and I'm here tonight to congratulate and to celebrate my friend David Rockwell. No one is more deserving than you are, David, 
for the way that you bring people together with your work and for your support of the New York Stem Cell Foundation. Never has this sort of support been more important than this year. During this pandemic, through innovation and excellence in biomedical research, the New York Stem Cell Foundation is finding treatments, better treatments for all of us in our community. We need this sort of support. And tonight on the screen, you will find many ways to donate. No amount is too small or too large. It all goes towards something I think we can all agree is very important. Thank you for anything you can give and congratulations to David. Hello to everyone watching this at home this evening. I am so happy to be here with you tonight to show up for science and celebrate stem cell research. For so many of us, when our loved ones get sick, we don't have sufficient treatments to make them better. Now, I myself suffer from glaucoma. Yes, I know a lot of people think, really? Yes, really. It's a disease of the eye that today remains incurable. At the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute, scientists are on the cusp of treating patients with macular degeneration using stem cells, and they're working towards a therapy for glaucoma. But this is just the beginning. There are so many other diseases that stem cells can hold the potential to not just treat, but to cure. So to learn more, you're gonna visit NICEF's Specialized Cell Therapy Facility to take a look at how their scientists are creating eye cells to treat patients with macular degeneration. Thank you, Whoopi. I'm Dr. Howard Kim, and I lead the cell therapy team here at NICEF. Let me show you to our cell therapy manufacturing suite. Uh, this is where we grow our patient cells, uh, turn them into stem cells, and turn those stem cells into cells that we can transplant back into the patient's body. A lot of diseases of our time are caused by the death of our natural cells, and cures are, can only really be realized when, when those cells are replaced. Uh, this clean room will meet FDA standards for growing cells that are uh, suitable for transplants back into the patient's body. And here we have Cecile, who is working in one of our uh, clean room hoods, manufacturing cells. The first disease we're working on is age-related macular degeneration, which is a common form of blindness. In this disease, the cells at the central part of your retina, called macula, are the cells that die, and those are the cells we're trying to replace. These cells are called retinal pigmented epithelia, and these are what cells we can grow from stem cells. So what we're looking at here are retinal cells that we have in a dish that were made from uh, patient stem cells. Uh, the patient has macular degeneration. And so what, there are a number of key features of those cells. One of them is their shape. They look like cobblestones. The retinal cells in the adult eye are known to be completely black, like some of the ones we're seeing here. In the younger uh, individual, those cells are gonna be less black. So what we have is in this dish are retinal cells that are on their way of becoming adult cells. And once they will all be black, they will be ready to be transplanted into the back of the eye of the patient. The patient's body is not going to reject the transplant because those cells will be coming from his own body. So we are collaborating with the top ophthalmological surgeons and scientists at Columbia University Medical Center to so that patients who are losing their sight because of age-related macular degeneration can recover their sight. This is our first cell therapy, but we have other investigational programs in glaucoma, blood cancer, and other diseases. We are very proud and excited for this brand new facility, and we thank you for visiting us. There are nearly 7,000 identified rare diseases. While each disease independently affects fewer than 200,000 people, all these rare diseases combined, well, they affect about 30 million Americans, 10% of the U.S. population. Our scientists reap extraordinary benefits from studying these diseases, and it offers us valuable information, even about more common illnesses as a result. 
infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy, or INAD. It's a rare disease that presents in children between the ages of 6 and 18 months. Arya Panwala was diagnosed in 2016. Her mother, Lena, founded the INAD Cure Foundation in search of new treatments for this deadly illness. NICEF has partnered with the INAD Cure Foundation, and right now we want to show you a short film about the Panwala family and this collaboration. Life for us with our daughter Arya comes with its own set of challenges. When she was 14 months old, we noticed something wasn't quite right. She started presenting with what we later learned to be nystagmus, which was um, her pupils shaking back and forth. Almost a full year later, Arya was diagnosed with infantile neuroaxonal dystrophy. INAD is categorized as an ultra-rare genetic disease. There is probably about 200 known cases in the entire world. It's basically like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's for little children. There's currently no known treatment for this disease. Girl. So it's a lot. That's one of the things I still remember is, okay, what do you mean she's, she's not gonna be able to? play with her toys or she's not gonna, she's gonna continue to regress. So, yeah, it's challenging. But um, doing the work that we do really helps. We wanted to be the voice that these children didn't have. We learned real fast that there was not much known about the disease. I reached out to researchers when I couldn't sleep at night. One of the pieces of the puzzle that could potentially lead to a cure was something called gene editing. So that's how I reached out to NICEF. I needed to partner with an organization to collect cells from families, store them for us, and then we could use those cells for research. So now the New York Stem Cell Foundation is one of our, our biggest partners. The groundbreaking work that they're doing really gives our organization a lot of hope. Our day starts with getting her ready. She's 100% dependent on us. We try to keep her going, we try to keep her stimulated. Earlier this year, we had some great news come out of NICEF. They were able to successfully edit the mutation in one of the cell lines. Our, our children are fighters. We believe in supporting them, encouraging them, keeping them in the best health possible to maybe one day be a part of these cell therapies. We are working with the top scientists at NICEF until together we can ultimately cure this disease. Now, as you just saw, stem cells offer us hope. Hope that in our lifetime, we will have treatments for what we think of today as untreatable conditions. And we can all help to accelerate the realization of that hope. So call, text, or donate. That's right. Call, text, or donate now to support the research that you've been hearing about tonight. The more money we raise, the, the more research NICEF can do to find the cures that we all seek. So be generous if you can and uh, do whatever you can because whatever you do to help may actually change the life of someone you love. Good night. We know, of course, that our genetic makeup affects our individual experiences of disease, as well as how we respond to treatments. And it's also long been recognized that medical research, and specifically clinical trials, do not really adequately represent the demographic diversity of the populations that the drugs and the trials are aiming to serve. COVID-19, in fact, has, has been shining a new and glaring light, frankly, on the racial disparities in illness and outcomes. We know that minorities have been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, and yet, if you look deeply, even the most current trials do not include an adequate representation of racial minorities, again, people who are most affected by the disease. 
So now we're going to hear how stem cells might play a role in changing this paradigm. And it's my great pleasure to introduce actor Lily Cooper to lead the discussion about this. Thank you, Sanjay. I am speaking with NYSIF's Dr. Reka Iyer to discuss racial inequality in medical research and how NYSIF is using stem cells to ensure that the diversity of the world's population is represented in research. Um, so, Reka, I understand that you are a geneticist? Yes, that's right. Believe it or not, I actually played a scientist on Broadway. I played Sandy Cheeks, the squirrel, in SpongeBob SquarePants. Um, and Sandy was a brilliant scientist in many areas, but I, I never really got to delve in the genetics. Um, so can you talk a little bit about genetics and its impact on disease in particular? You know, DNA is really the recipe for what makes all of us unique. It makes me me, it makes you you, it makes Sandy the squirrel, Sandy the squirrel. And DNA is a big part of why diseases affect each of us so differently. And so where stem cells come in is really helping us to see the impact of those differences. We've really seen firsthand that COVID-19 has affected racial minorities at just a jarringly higher rate than others. Can you talk a little bit about why that is and how genetics played a role in that disparity? Yeah, absolutely. And that really has been one of the most tragic parts of this pandemic. Um, and it's not really limited to COVID-19. I mean, it happens with other diseases too, uh, definitely for the diseases that NYSIF works on. And at the root of all of this is, unfortunately, it's systemic racism, which has reared its head in so many ways um, during 2020. And, you know, access to healthcare is certainly part of that too. We see it also at the research level, where ethnic minorities are really just underrepresented at every sort of phase of the research pipeline. So a lot of what we learn from research and clinical trials just really isn't applicable to uh, ethnic minorities. But nice if the way that we're taking this on is with our stem cell technology. Um, all of those robots that Dan showed us earlier, we're using them to build thousands and thousands of stem cell lines representing the full diversity of the world's population. So, okay, in, in an ideal world, we have this beautiful, diverse supply of stem cells from every walk of life, every type of human on this earth. And once we have those stem cells from diverse populations, what are they used for and, and how do you kind of use them? You know, stem cells are kind of like an avatar for you. You know, they, um, you, you, we can study in a dish how your cells are affected by a certain disease and how you know, different drugs that we test you know, right there in the dish affect your cells, whether they're helpful, whether they might be unsafe for you. Um, and so what we want to do with this biobank is equip scientists all over the world with this resource so that they can test in their research you know, what's, uh, how diseases affect all of these diverse populations. So that's what we think we can do to make the biggest impact here at NYSEF on fixing racial health disparities. Yes. Wow. It's amazing. It's using science not only to help understand the world better, but to help heal it. I definitely think that was Sandy's approach. You know, she actually saved SpongeBob and all of Bikini Bottom with her scientific expertise. So... I approve. Um, <laughs> it is more important now than ever. I love this idea of diverse stem cell avatars that we can use to make sure everybody benefits from medical breakthroughs. And I repeat, everybody. Um, thank you so much, Reka, for speaking with me today. This was wonderful. The effects of a microgravity environment. It's had my personal interest since the International Space Station launched in 1998. Four years ago, I had a chance to interview NASA astronauts, twins, Scott and Mark Kelly. That was right after Scott completed a one-year mission on board the ISS. Spending this time on the microgravity changed Scott's body from his weight down to his genes. That was according to the NASA's twin study. But he actually returned to normal once he returned to Earth. It, there's so much to learn there. I was fascinated to learn that last December, nice of scientists led research studying the effects of microgravity on cells derived from stem cells to better understand their impact on things like multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease. The cells actually traveled aboard SpaceX-19 to the International Space Station. So, so now let's look at the story of these incredible stem cell and their journey into space with Tony Award-winning actor Santino Fontana. Good evening. It's wonderful to be here to talk about stem cells in space. Last year, when NYSIF scientists sent the brain cells to the International Space Station, they weren't sure what they were going to find out. Hey, However, Nino. hi. 
Hi. Hey, Emily Ashford. What are you doing here? Oh, hey. Um, I'm here because I'm an astronaut. No, <laughs> no, you're not. You're 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 an actress. You've been on TV. You're on. You, you won a Tony. Oh, thank you. I am an actress, but like many people in this world, I am a lot of things. I actually went back to school during quarantine for physics and astro science. So yeah. That seems like a lot. I made great use of my quarantine time. I read all these books. I bought puzzles. So let's let's get to the subject at hand. I was supposed to ask an ask. Okay. Can you tell us why you would want to study brain cells on the space station? That's a great question for an astronaut like myself. So when you do stem cell experiments, um, let me explain this. <laughs> there are many variables that affect the behavior of the cells, including physical forces like gravity. So by sending the brain cells to the space station in a microgravity environment, the scientists like me are able to see how microglia cells in MS and Parkinson's cells behave in the absence of Gravity. Wow. You do you do know what you're talking about. Yep. Uh, so, um, okay. So uh, when you are on the space station, how do you actually keep the stem cells alive? Oh, that's such a good question. This is my favorite part. I mean, this is why I got in the business. Okay. So before the cells are launched into space, they are put into a fully enclosed automated cube lab that houses the cells and keeps them alive and well while they're on their way to the space station. And while they are on the space station, it's great. I love that cube lab. Wow. One more question. I've always been curious about this. Uh, how do you go to the bathroom? Um, that's top secret information. Uh, I have to go. I've got a mission, but it was so good to see you. I'm so glad I could teach you today. Thanks. Um, thanks, Annalie. I, uh, now to tell us a bit more about conducting research in outer space are Dr. Serena Anand-Chancellor and Dr. Peggy Whitson. Dr. Anand-Chancellor, a physician, recently served as flight engineer on the International Space Station. Dr. Peggy Whitson, a biochemist, is former commander of the International Space Station and holds the U.S. record for most time spent in space with 665 days. Hey, good evening. My name is Dr. Serena Anand-Chancellor. Uh, I spent 197 days on board the ISS as flight engineer on expeditions 56 and 57. Um, one of the biggest misconceptions I like to uh, talk about in regards to the space station is the life science research we do on orbit. Many people believe that we do research in space for space, and the reality of it is that 70 to 80 percent of the life science research we do is for medical health here on Earth. Now, Peg, I know you worked on a, a bunch of stem cell experiments while you were up there as well. What did you think about that? Oh, that was one of the most fun things. And actually, we, we were growing mesenchymal stem cells. Um, but what we found is the stem cells actually grow even faster. So it's something that we can do in orbit that we can do better than here on the ground. And that can have future manufacturing applications for us. And they, those can, cells can provide therapies here on the ground, cell therapies for people with various different types of diseases. For instance, uh, Parkinson's or multiple sclerosis. These are some examples of one of the specific experiments that I know that folks are interested in looking at. What was, your, what was your favorite experiment? So we were looking at endothelial cells, which are the um, cells that line the blood vessels in our body. And because these cells seem to grow so much better in space, because I, I really believe they think they're in the body, they grow better 3D structure and, and better function. And so that allowed the researchers to test their chemotherapy agents against these cells. So we were testing agents against cancer or a tumor's blood supply to be more specific. And the researchers were excited because it gave them so much more opportunity to do that on board the space station. So the cool thing about stem cells is really thinking about where we're headed in the future. And uh, I think folks really haven't considered the space station as a place where we may create some of these things and actually bring them back down to earth. But I think we're closer to that than everybody thinks. I absolutely agree with you, Serena. I, I really do see that there's gonna be some huge payoffs for 
the research that can come from doing this stem cell work. So I'm, re I'm really excited about our future and I hope everyone is because I, I think it's gonna be a lot of fun. Hey everybody, Billy Porter here. Um, what an incredibly inspiring evening. I am honored to join my dear friend, David Rockwell and tonight's honorees, Brooke Ellison and Frank Geary in showing up for science. This year has proven that science is a foundation of our future. NYSCF is leading the way in innovation and stem cell research by performing high risk, high reward research that is so desperately needed by patients around the world. Together, we must all join NYSCF to ensure all people can lead healthy and fulfilling lives. God bless you all. Cancer is a devastating diagnosis. As a cancer survivor myself, I know the urgency of finding new treatments and cures for this disease. It is my great pleasure to introduce the esteemed actor, Jesse Tyler Ferguson, to hear more about our cancer program. Hi, I'm Jesse Tyler Ferguson. I'm so thrilled to be here with Dr. Laura Andreas Martin. So nice meeting you. So nice to meet you, Jesse. Thank you. Um, I am, uh, I've had a little bit of skin cancer in my day. My husband is a cancer survivor as well. So thank you so much for everything that you do. Um, your work is so, so important. Can you tell me a little bit about how cancers are treated today? Yeah, of course. Um, so typically, it depends on the cancer type. Uh, you can have surgery, chemotherapy, short-term solution normally. Uh, and then uh, many patients now are getting their genetics, meaning that understanding what is grown on their DNA and why the cells are becoming uh, a tumor. Um, so that there is some tailored or targeted therapies that can be uh, applied to those uh, alterations. Uh, but the problem is that for many cancers, and that includes women's reproductive cancers, especially for ovarian, there is none or only one targeted therapy that works for little amount of patients. So that um, what happened with this cancer type is that survival rates has not changed in decades. In the past 40 years, it remains the same. So the survival rate today is the same as it was 40 years ago. Exactly. Wow. So I mean, how how do we how do we change that? How do we are we looking for new ways to treat cancer? Yeah. So. The reason is that there is no new treatments or only one new treatment coming up in the past few years. Uh, so we are trying to come up with new treatments, new drugs, new therapies. Um, but also we want to make those therapies to be more efficient to each specific patient uh, because what works for one patient, it may doesn't work for the other patient. Uh, so we are trying to discover new drugs, but also which drugs are going to work better for that specific person. Exactly. I mean, because you don't want to, you don't want patients taking drugs that they don't need to. I mean, it's a waste of their time. It's a waste of your time. Sadly, a new technology has been available uh, for only a few years now, um, which uh, is basically we take the tumor from the patient on the day of the surgery and we can grow this in the lab in a way that is called tumor organoids. So we have material to do any uh, analysis or any assay that we want to do. Okay, wait, if I had cancer, you would take a piece of my tumor and you would grow it bigger in a lab. You'd, like, you'd make my tumor bigger so that you could test it. It's kind of like Dolly the sheep, but with, with tumors. Exactly, exactly. It's a little bit like her. <laughs> so what's happening with this model is that you can grow that specific person's tumor, create as much as you want, and then to do drug testing on them to see uh, which therapies are going to work better for that specific patient. Right. So now, doctor, you work with women's reproductive cancers. I mean, is this something that is only happening with ovarian cancer or is it with other cancers as well? So this we can apply to any solid tumor, any cancer type. As I say, we work in ovarian cancers because we saw that gap, the need uh, of changing the survival rate. That's amazing. I mean, it's, it's all just so incredible. I mean, I, I just have an actor sometimes. I, you know, I, I'll, I'll walk down the street and I'll have complete strangers just telling me I, I'm a fan of your work. And I just, I, I sometimes wish that everyone could hear that from complete strangers. And I just want to tell you right now, 
I am such a fan of your work. I am just so grateful for everything that you're doing and the work that you're doing is just so, so important. So thank you for talking with me for a little bit today, doctor. Thank you very much, Jesse. It was really nice. Someone who I've never met, but I would love to someday is coming up next. It is my great, great honor to welcome Yo-Yo Ma. Frank, I am so happy that I get a chance to honor you, my friend, who's being honored by the New York Stem Cell Foundation Research Institute. Now, people may say, outside of knowing of your devotion to science, what is the connection? Architecture and stem cells. Frank also happens to love many things. He loves music. He's passionate about civil society and education. And in all of those matters, it starts from very, very simple things. Like telling the truth, looking for the truth. Like building teams through building trust. Like the idea of service. What is it for? Who is it for? Who benefits? These are not isolated questions for architecture or even stem cell research. It's for all of us. And I admire Frank not only because of the fact that he has designed some of the most memorable structures and monuments that we have today on our planet. It's because he cares about all of the planet. And that's a hard thing to express, but you can feel that in his buildings. You can feel that in his talks. So to help celebrate the honor, Frank, that you're receiving tonight, I'd like to play two little pieces for you. One is about the simplicity of gesture, of starting with simple gifts from simple stem cells, from simple ideas, and developing the sense of home, home for ourselves, for our institutions, home for our planet. So here they are, simple gifts and going home.
lots of love. Any creative happenings, I believe, start with curiosity. My work starts with curiosity. What if I dabbed a little red here? What if I turned the can over and dripped the paintings all over the canvas? Everybody working in worlds of discovery are always curious. Scientists are looking for cures, finding answers to questions of the human body. And they start with why and where and how. It's the same for any kind of creativity, I think. Scientific research, there's a lot more writing on the, on the outcome, I guess, because it's, it's life and death. But for the artist, it's the same gravitas. One keeps you alive if they do it right. <laughs> the other one makes you smile a little bit, maybe. My daughter died of cancer and uterine cancer. And it was a shock because it happened so quickly. And so within, I think, six months of finding out, she passed away. There's nobody seems safe from it. It's just a matter of when. That's what's interesting about somebody like Susan to just come out of the blue and take it on. And she created this, this foundation. Her intelligence and her love for people, she just doesn't give up. I visited her one day a few months ago in her laboratory. I was knocked off my pins to see how well organized it was and how professional this research multiplies that leads to a broader spectrum of, of solutions for a lot of other things. And that's very exciting. I think uh, science is about connecting ideas from medical research over time, searching for different ways to interpret the information. Art is always being looked at, reinterpreted, it's a constant uh, making, evaluating, and then reevaluating. I think it's the same for all creative work. It's not static. What a great honor to be receiving this award from Stem Cell Foundation. I've watched Susan since she started it and grew it and made it a wonderful incredibly important venue for medical research. Great to be part of it. Great to get the award. Thank you, Susan. Alzheimer's disease has always been part of my life. I lost my grandfather to it when I was 12 and my grandmother when I was 18. My mother was diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's when she was only 55. Seeing the devastating impact Alzheimer's has on families like Lauren's, we made it our family's mission to educate and advocate for other patients and families also suffering from this disease. It's a disease with no effective treatments and little hope for patients, but stem cell research has provided us with some hope, hope that we can and will find a cure. We feel lucky to be able to see this research in action and are excited to see the progress continue to unfold. At the New York Stem Cell Foundation, scientists are conducting research on brain diseases, including Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, multiple sclerosis, ALS, and others. Tonight, we're going to hear from Carrie Harold, a teacher in Wisconsin with multiple sclerosis, and Dr. Valentina Fossati, a NICIF scientist who, when diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, turned her personal journey into her life's work. Hi, Carrie. How are you? Hello, Valentina. It's so nice to see you. How is it going? Life is good. Uh, MS itself is a roller coaster of a disease. How are you doing with your MS journey? For me, it's been 10 years. I feel I'm, I'm very lucky compared to many other patients. You know, this is a disease that acts in a different way from each of us. 
the first time you came uh, to our uh, lab in New York City, it was uh, 2013? Yes. I got to look at human living brain cells under a microscope. It blew my mind away. We had donated our embryos from IVF, and then we also were able to donate skin cells. Now you probably saw the first first cells that we made. I, I wasn't even ever working on, on brain. But then during my postdoc, you know, as I got diagnosed, the more I realized, you know, very little was known about the brain cells that die in MS. And so from then we, we moved forward uh, very much. Finally, what we can do is to take your skin fibroblast, uh, turn them into the myelinating cells of the brain, and in a dish, testing different drugs. That is so exciting. I've been reading about glia in, in your research. So can you tell me a little bit more about what the glia are and the role that they play? Yeah. So glia is a big name. It's actually kind of a silly name. It means glue uh, in Greek. I think that sticks the neurons together. Uh, but in, in fact, there are really three different cell types within the glia population. One is the myelinating cells of the brain, which are oligodendrocytes. And then we have astrocytes and microglia. Those cells are really important to keep the neurons healthy. They support the neurons. They give nutrients and they keep everything, the environment clean. Uh, but we are uh, more and more seeing that in, uh, in MS, but also in Alzheimer's disease, in Parkinson's disease, these cells tend to go crazy. And so they don't do their job anymore. And uh, instead of supporting the neurons, they, they ended up killing the neurons. So they are literally killing the neurons. And so again, here we are really excited to now being able to have a platform where we can test drugs that can stop this mechanism. This just blows me away, Valentina, because as a teacher, you know, I've been sharing this information with my students and I talk about NICEF and the process. It gives me hope that you know, there's going to be a cure for my own children. There's going to be a cure for my students. Thank you very much for uh, your support. It really means a lot for me and uh, for all other scientists to know that the patients believe in us. That's our driving force. As fellow patient advocates, we know that the New York Stem Cell Foundation is at the forefront of using stem cell research to find better treatments for our loved ones. It is so important that we support the researchers at NICIF that are working tirelessly behind the scenes. There are multiple ways to give on the screen right now. Please support this work if you can. No amount is too small. Every dollar raised tonight brings us closer to cures. In type 1 diabetes, the body does not produce enough insulin because typically the immune system has attacked the cells that produce the insulin. In type 2 diabetes, the body does not use insulin properly or produce enough of it to maintain regular blood sugar levels. Now, one thing you should know, it is diabetes that actually launched Susan's commitment to discovery of a cure, and NICEF is dedicated to uncovering diabetes causes and finding that cure. Now, at the NICEF Research Institute, their, their researchers are creating the insulin producing cells affected in diabetes. And that's a crucial foundation to this research. When I visited NICEF, I, in fact, I observed this cutting edge work myself. And tonight, renowned actor Victor Garber, who lives with type 1 diabetes, is going to help us to understand how this hope for a cure is being hatched from these cells. Hello, I'm Victor Garber. I was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in the early 60s. I was 12 years old. I had a cousin who was type one, so I had a sense of what was ahead of me. I'm now in my seventies and I am eternally grateful for the technological advances that make my daily life much less hazardous. I always had a sense that the cure for type one was somehow stem cell related. And I am delighted to be here today with Dr. Scott Noggle from NYSCF, N-Y-S-C-F, who is head of research for this organization. And hello, Scott, lovely to meet you. Great to see you as well, Victor. Tell us what is, what is on your plate with uh, diabetes research. So our goal at NICEF is really to try to accomplish that sort of once and done cure um, so that you know, people with type one diabetes can not have to worry about managing their sort of day-to-day -day insulin and, and glucose levels. This is really a sort of an important disease for me to, to be involved with as well because my mother-in-law actually passed away from complications from type 1 diabetes. What you're talking about is a cure. It's not just something to help us 
because we have so many, you know, gizmos, I've got them all on me, uh, that, that are, are helping me much, you know, navigate much more freely. But you're saying this is a cure. That, that is our goal, that would um, provide you with a new source of insulin that regulates itself, essentially trying to replace the cells that are lost in type 1 diabetes. I'm so, so lost in all of this. But you would, you would use my own stem cells and then somehow... Uh, uh, inject them into me, and is that the, the, the hope? So what we can do is take skin cells or blood cells from you, from a patient with type 1 diabetes, um, and then uh, convert those stem cells into the beta cells that are actually the ones that are responsible for producing insulin and responding to glucose levels. We've gotten really good over the past years is actually doing that. And the idea is that we would then take those beta cells and transplant them into your, your body. And, and, w and when can I sign up? <laughs> How do you uh, keep from, uh, the, from me rejecting those, those cells? That's a really good question, a really important in type 1 diabetes in particular. Um, because as you know, the, the, the main cause of the loss of those beta cells in your body is because the immune system is uh, co constantly attacking them and destroying them. And um, what we're trying to do is basically hide the cells from the immune system um, by altering the proteins and the, the, the different components of the cell that, that the immune system might see. Um, and we're doing this using a, a new technology called uh, CRISPR-Cas9. Uh, which is remarkable. I mean, they just didn't they just win the Nobel Prize? Yeah, exactly. They just won the Nobel Prize. Um, you know, it's a powerful technique for basically ch editing and changing uh, the DNA in your cells. Um, so the, the idea is that if we can protect those beta cells, we would eventually um, a, accomplish a, a, a cure, a long-term cure. Well, this is remarkable and, and, by the way, extremely encouraging. So how far away are we? You know, in the next five, ten years, I think we're, we're, getting, we're getting very close. This is amazing. I'm so grateful to you and, and everyone you're working with for doing this. And I would like to uh, say right now, I'm, I, I will sign up immediately. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Good evening, I'm John Slattery. 16 years ago, I had the pleasure of playing the role of Brooke Ellison's father, Ed, in the movie about her life, directed by her friend, late Christopher Reeve. While playing this role, I learned about an inspirational woman who, after being paralyzed when she was only 11 years old, fought to recover, and then went on to thrive, graduating from Harvard with a degree in cognitive neuroscience and from the Kennedy School with her master's. I learned about a woman who, despite incredible challenges, was smart, kind, and determined to make the world a better place. Brooke later got her PhD from Stony Brook University, where she's now an associate professor. A policy and ethics expert, Brooke committed her career to changing the popular perception of life-changing science. As a stem cell advocate, she played a critical role in advancing stem cell research in this country, and for eight years served on the Empire State Stem Cell Board where she helped design New York State's stem cell policy. I'm grateful she has devoted her life to advocacy, ethics, and education, as her contributions to these fields have been enormous. It is my great privilege to join the program tonight in honor of Brooke Ellison, a true stem cell hero. When I was growing up, I was involved in dancing and singing and little league baseball. So all of these things were really so deeply embedded in my life and how I understood myself. When I was 11 years old, I was walking home from my first day of seventh grade. I had to cross a fairly busy highway. I was hit by a car. In that instance, my life changed completely. All of the things that I thought made me who I was essentially evaporated. Today, I am an associate professor at Stony Brook University. I focus on medical ethics and health policy. And that students can share some of my personal experiences. So when I was 11 years old, the information that was given to my parents and to me was that you have suffered a spinal cord injury and there is nothing that can be done about that. 
people who are diagnosed with conditions like ALS or diabetes or MS or Parkinson's disease or Alzheimer's disease, that is the very same thing that they are told. It is so overwhelming and so difficult to try to integrate into your reality that nobody should have to hear that. For all of these years, I have viewed stem cell research as the counterpoint to that, as the best opportunity to change that narrative. We care about people who are suffering in ways that are unimaginable, that we are going to make the investment in improving their lives. When I was in graduate school at the Harvard Kennedy School, I first spoke publicly about stem cell research. There was an article that I had read it was about efforts being made to curtail research, and I thought that that was quite astonishing, quite shocking. That kind of launched me on this initiative to get people to understand why this is important. And uh, that was extremely empowering. I was able to integrate that into my identity in the very same ways that I was you know, a dancer when I was a child, but now I viewed myself as an advocate. NICEF was founded uh, around the very same time that I was coming into my own role in the overall stem cell advocacy movement. Lies in the face of religious practice. It was, um, it was a very unfortunate time. Taking on any cause, especially one that was um, at that time so kind of fraught with misunderstanding, takes immense courage and immense bravery. And Susan did that. She put herself on the front lines of an issue that you know, I care about, but so many people um, have since come to care about. For all of these years, I've looked to scientists for uh, as mechanisms of hope, of building that sense of hope. But the voice of science is being drowned out. Having organizations like NICEF puts a protection on that. It allows us to continue to move forward. That is the very purpose of science, and that is the very purpose of stem cell research. Science has never been so much a beacon of hope as it is right now. I'm a firm believer in hope. Good evening, everyone. It isn't very often that we undergo experiences that elicit two seemingly contradictory emotions at the same time and in equal measure. But this award, which I accept with tremendous pride and deep humility, is one of those times. For the past 20 years, I've been so proud to be part of not only a field, but indeed a social movement, which has at its very core the vision of using our collective knowledge and talents to alleviate the most unimaginable forms of human suffering. And at the very same time, I'm humbled and awestruck both by what this field has accomplished in its short history and what currently unimaginable advances lie ahead. When I first became involved in stem cell research, I did it because I saw it as a critical source of hope for those for whom hope might be hard to find. For those like myself who were told that the disease or disability they were experiencing was incurable, unchangeable. Stem cell research has been the beacon of hope that has forced us to rethink those very ideas to redefine those words. But this is not just an idea, it's an action and an imperative. And over these past 20 years, I've seen this hope be brought to life through this work with scientists, advocates, philanthropists, visionaries, and patients coming together to unlock the mysteries of disease and the physical limitations brought about by disability and there's no organization that's been more on the forefront of this fight, nor more emblematic of the hope to be found in it than has been the New York Stem Cell Foundation. There's never been a time in my life when the authority and promise of science has been so important, 
yet the very same time has been so eroded or called into question than they are right now. And because of that, there's no more important time to be involved in science. Difficult, yet potentially life-altering science. And not just to be involved, but to be vocal and to be committed to it. For me, this commitment has always been reward enough in and of itself. But accepting this award on behalf of the work that I've been so proud to be a part of from an organization that I so deeply admire is not just an honor, it's a privilege and a renewed call to action, especially now, especially in these times. So thank you, Susan, and everyone at NICEF. Thank you for this award. You are the gold standard of stem cell heroes that can only hope to emulate. And thank you for the work that you do every day. I can't wait to see what the future holds. Just gotta say, uh, what an incredible program tonight. And it's encouraging to know that these new therapies are within our reach. And it's also been nice to talk about something other than COVID completely for just a little bit tonight. If you already uh, texted a pledge or given online to support the NISA Research Institute, thank you for that. If you haven't had a chance yet to make a gift, you still have time. Even after the program ends, make sure to visit the online gala auction as well. That's going to close at 9 p.m. That features works by artists who were moved to show up for science by generously donating their talents. NICEF's mission is to accelerate cures for the major diseases of our time. You know, for me, uh, this sort of thing, this sort of work is not just about the cures that I'm gonna see in my lifetime. It's in part, large part, about the world I can help shape for my own daughters and their children, my grandchildren. Stem cell research, I think, is, is really likely to allow future generations to look at diseases like Alzheimer's and diabetes and other chronic and degenerative conditions the way that we have seen polio or smallpox. We can see those as diseases of the past. Just think about that. It would be a remarkable thing. And NICEF is showing up every day to make that sort of vision a reality. So hope we can all help them get there. It's been an honor for me to join all of you in celebrating our optimism for the future of human health. I want to thank you for showing up with NICEF tonight. Stay safe. Be well.